Dr. Rebecca Davis is an Associate Professor of Professional Practice and Director of the Office of Global Programs at Rogers University School of Social Work in New Jersey, USA. Rebecca teaches social work practice methods, global social work, and international service learning courses. She supervises serving, serving, sorry, service learning programs, sorry, in partnership with Babesh Boyan University in Cluj, Napoca, Romania. I saw that Alina from, from that university was around before. I'm not sure if she's <laughs> she, she also <laughs> Rebecca also assists in service learning programs in Mexico, Israel, China, and India. Dr. Davis's global work focuses on social work education and child protection system strengthening in Eastern Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa with a special focus on violence against children. Her recent work included social service workforce assessments in Eastern Europe, strengthening case management services in Nigeria, Malawi, Swaziland, and Namibia, and evaluation of child welfare work reforms in Ghana. She co-authored and authored lots of papers and, and different publications, um, and she uh, represents the International Association of Schools of social work to the United Nations, and uh, she's a member of di diverse organizations. Good. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I'll share my screen. And um, Nancy, do you and Mihai want to? We can see your screen perfectly well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, um, my presentation is going to be on uh, looking at an integrated model of social work field education and international service learning. Um, but both the benefits and the challenges. We'll um, talk about uh, both of those. Uh, and I would like to uh, introduce our team if, um, let's see. Um, sorry about that. Uh, Dr. Yavu, Miha Yavu, who's associate professor um, in the social work department at um, Babish Boy University in Cluj. He happens to be in the US right now with uh, us on a Fulbright. Uh, Mihai, you want to say hello? Yeah, hello, hello everybody. I'm here. <laughs> okay, because they'll be they'll be um, discussing with me um, as well. And uh, Nancy Schley, who is the associate director of field education for um, our program uh, in at Rutgers University. And Nancy, you can say hello. Hi, thank you. <laughs> Good to be um, here. So the three of us really have worked together on this program. So we're, um, we're really excited about being able to share um, some of the experiences and also just the evolution um, of the, the program. Let me, okay. Um, so um, just to kind of give you an overview of what I'm gonna go over is um, I, I wanna situate a community university partnership uh, for global service learning within the UN volunteer framework and the sustainable development goals. Um, and that's something that, that we uh, present to the students so they can understand how this uh, builds on kind of um, uh, global development. Um, also look at the framework um, for experiential education approaches the different approaches and how they relate to the service learning model. Um, and then identify some of the commonalities and differences between service learning and field education within a social justice framework. Uh, and then um, also, I think some of this parallels the, the previous uh, presentations on really looking at the pedagogical challenges for implementing field education within a service learning model with special attention to social justice and liberatory practices. Um, and then finally, we'll look at some reflection exercises 
um, that support resilient thinking while also addressing and trying to reduce deficit thinking and privileged perspectives among student uh, learners. Uh, so first, I just want to reflect on the UN's emphasis on volunteerism as a universal social behavior that really reflects and builds on people's desires to change. Um, and also the importance of seeing volunteering is not just cost reduction, um, but it's more important than that. It, it really is part of civic engagement and it is also localizes the 2030 UN agenda and sustainable development goals by providing the space between governments and people um, and, and really focusing on concrete, contextualized uh, local changes. Also part of the UN um, framework is the resilience model. And so rather than building on deficits, really build on the resilience of people and people's ability to uh, make changes through voluntary action. So I think that's an important kind of um, backdrop on um, the different approaches to uh, volunteer uh, service. So for at least in the US, Robert Sigman um, was one of the first ones that really defined service learning um, as an experiential education approach, but premised on reciprocal learning. And that means, as has been discussed, the provider and receiver are both in this together. They're both learning um, and both uh, benefiting. Um, and then he later refined his definition to stress the balance between the learning goals and service outcomes. Um, and so today, service learning really is applied to a wide range of experiential education uh, approaches, including volunteerism, community, and community engaged projects, field education, internships, and all of this is um, domestic as well as global. My focus is gonna be more on um, global um, service learning. So what can we, what, what makes service learning different from other forms of experiential education? According to the National Society for Experiential Education, service learning has these three important components. It's carefully supervised, it had the student has established learning goals and active re, actively reflects on what is being learned through experience. And this is kind of the, the diagram I think that's very useful um, for kind of orienting um, students as well as um, um, uh, certain community agencies that this is kind of the model we want to try to reflect. And so you've got the two components of the beneficiary, the one uh, that's receiving the service, and then the one who's providing the service. And so it's a balance, they're, they're both shared um, for service learning. Whereas in this model, you see field education is a little more on the side of the learning uh, component and the one that is, is learning. But again, I think this is an important, um, approach to, to, to really aim for um, as we um, develop our programs. So basically today there tends to be, <clears throat> excuse me, a consensus that service learning has three important characteristics. It's a focus on effectively, efficiently addressing needs with a community, not just for the community. Um, and it's active student involvement in all stages from planning to assessment and intentionally linked to learning content. So that curriculum integration um, is a part of it. So these are three key factors, whether it's domestic or, um, or global. And so this is the, the um, diagram I think that's very applicable to us where service learning really is the balance of all these. Um, and, and hopefully internships field work can um, integrate all of these components uh, as well. 
Um, but as you see in this model, the again, academic study and practical experience seem to, to have a little bit more weight. Um, and again, we're going to talk some more about that and hope to have a discussion about what some of the, the um, ideas are and, and approaches um, that, that you have. Um, I think that, and again, this parallels, um, particularly I was listening to what I heard Barbara say earlier, uh, in terms of the Latin American model and what that has contributed, and I think can contribute more um, as we move forward in our, our own in our own programs. So service learning, um, which was informed by the theoretical influences from John Dewey to Frere, um, but the idea of solidarity, and I think this is a really a key concept um, because it, it really means it's the bonding that takes place, helping each other in an organized and effective way, working together for a common cause, standing as a group or as a nation to defend rights. So it's really the connectedness and bonding for the common, for the common good. Um, and as a pedagogical method, um, it's, it's through the solidarity that really serves the needs of the community, as well as improves the quality of academic learning and spurs the formation of personal values and responsible citizenship. So it's that formation of values which um, really contributes, which the, the, the Latin American model really contributes. And I think what's most important, and this fits within some of the, the, the um, reforms we're looking at in our own curriculum, is the aim is to overcome the usual power differentials established in the donor recipient relationship. Um, distancing itself from the patterns of beneficence or um, patr patronage. And, um, and, I, and again, this parallels what um, I was hearing before in terms of the commitment to social trans transformation. So looking at service learning and social justice, what does the evidence show? So some of the evidence shows that service learning courses lead to positive student outcomes across academic, civic, personal, and social domains, but not always. Um, some of the critics suggest that service learning has a potential to perpetuate existing systems of class, privilege, and norms of harmful disparities rather than challenging them. And there's, there's um, quite a bit of literature out there looking at some of these uh, outcomes. And, and again, some of the research, the, there is a lack of research in this area as well. Um, Deficit-based views of marginalized social groups reinforce existing hierarchies and generally affect little change other than a student's own view of themselves. And I, I've experienced this. I've heard many times study abroad changed my life. And, and I, I look at that much more critically now because, yes, it's changed your life. But what about the others, the ones you were involved in? Um, and so it goes back to how we really can measure and how we can impact um, um, uh, mutually um, the, the ones we're working with, the ones we're serving. Um, so practitioners and educators, I know for myself, when we want to make sure that service learning and community engagement practices do reflect social justice principles, we have we struggle against the dominant culture. We have to struggle against the status quo um, in which our students are actually practicing or working. So this is a, this is a, a tension that I think we, um, we, we, we do uh, constantly address. I know certainly in the practice classes, um, this is a topic that, that comes up in terms of ethical challenges that students are facing. Uh, in, their, uh, in their practice placements. So one of the examples I wanted to give, and this is uh, something that I know UNICEF has been addressing, is um, 
orphan tourism. Um, and this is quite prevalent in um, at least for American or North American um, students. Volunteerism in orphanages, often referred to as orphan tourism, remains among the most popular forms of hands-on global ex educational experiences undertaken by students and especially in the field of social work and education. But there more recently, there have been very serious concerns that are raised about the impact of these experiences, not only on students, but also on the children uh, that they're serving. Um, although it's unintentional, um, there, there is an, an, a negative impact. Um, and so the, the, the narratives, um, you know, the question is, what are we teaching? What are we teaching students through this? Um, and, and we know that it can teach and reinforce the neoliberal capitalist perspectives about just what global inequality, about global inequality. And it doesn't really reflect the reality of the local context. Um, and so looking at what we're teaching, the, the approaches our students are using is very important. Um, and so one of the things that in our, um, in, certainly in the, the work in the teaching that we've been doing in our service learning program in Romania has evolved um, as most our, our students have always done their volunteer work in community-based organizations, um, really teaching what the best practices are and um, uh, ensuring that our services do no harm. Um, so it's it, the UNICEF has, has a, a literature on this um, and really looking at volunteer experiences where families are first and families are put first uh, within uh, com the community. So basically as a pedagogy, um, service learning is based in the concept that community and civic education can be innovative um, in that um, applying academic knowledge, acquiring competencies and skills, and what's most important is really addressing attitudes, changing or modifying attitudes. Um, and this is, this is one of the, a, a very important uh, part of um, what we, what we want to do. Um, and attitudes in the direction of, um, of inclusion, acceptance, um, so this is a model that critical community service learning, challenging institutional oppression. Um, and this is um, some work by Santiago Ortiz that I find very um, helpful uh, as we look at our, um, as we look at our practices, not only in service learning, but also in terms of what we're uh, teaching in the classroom. Um, so critical community service learning focuses on the root causes of inequality by addressing the, the um, power and oppression. And it explicitly, we explicitly must acknowledge the um, power and systemic inequality. Um, and it can be both revolutionary and a liberatory pedagogy um, that challenges institutional oppression and the status quo. And I know as we're beginning to implement liber a liberatory consciousness approach with our own curriculum, we're really, um, we're really challenging some of the theories we teach. We're challenging some of the, uh, some of the literature we use um, and uh, some of the authors and really looking at how diverse um, our, our curriculum is. Um, and at the same time, we're also looking at ways to apply this in our own communities where our, our schools are located. Um, and this particular approach really helps us look at the, the, the political nature of education and how complicit we are sometimes with structural oppression. Um, 
And again, I, I um, this parallels the the um, the Latin American model, and certainly the the um, the discussion that uh, and presentation we had we had before. Um, so, and and again, as as we heard before, it's about the dialogue. Um, so in the context of critical and anti-colonial approaches to service learning, um, the, the dialogue can serve as the conduit to explore difference. Um, and it also serves as a way to build on the strengths in relationships. Um, and Bell Hooks, who recently passed, um, said this well, as a, she's a, as a champion of dialogue, believe that to engage in dialogue is one of the simple ways we can begin as people, teachers, scholars, and critical thinkers to cross the barriers that may or may not be erected by race, gender, class, professional standing, and a host of other differences. So it's really the dialogue, the dialogic space that is, is where we make those connections. And the dialogue doesn't have to be in words. The dialogue can come in, um, in, in, different, in different ways. And I, I also um, reflect on uh, what Barbara was saying earlier in terms of we are, um, we're, we're trained as individuals to talk with others, but it's about talking um, with each other that's, that's important. So with that said, um, being able to situate field education as a reciprocal and critical service learning model has some challenges. And I wanna present these. And again, I, I hope we'll, we'll have some time for, um, for discussion about this. Um, so it, it looking at integrating these um, in theory, um, as you see, I have in theory and reality, uh, looking at both sides of this. In theory, situating field education within a reciprocal and critical service learning model can benefit student learners and communities by addressing oppressive practices um, and, and certainly ad addressing oppressive attitudes as well. Um, but in reality, practice learning, whether it be domestic or global, occurs within a socio-cultural, political, and economic context within our service systems that, um, that are existing. And these have the potential to negatively impact student learning and client outcomes and reinforcing some of the, the deficit um, thinking. In theory, Practice-based learning should incorporate critical reflections on hierarchies and power differentials within this sociocultural, political, and economic context. So it's the reflections, and that's what we'll talk uh, more about, um, that, that can really make the difference. But in reality, and this is some of the research has, that's been done on this, we, as field educators and instructors, and I have to count myself into this, can sometimes underestimate the value or maybe not prioritize the value of these critical reflections because we're overly focused sometimes on trying to get the students uh, oriented to help them learn the agency operations and the tasks. So getting things done. Um, and um, uh, uh, in some of the discussions we've had in our own field experiences, um, uh, students are placed in uh, uh, placed in a uh, field placement, and they have to hit the ground running. So it's a reality that um, I think sometimes we we also need uh, to address. Um, identifying oppressive practices in the workplace can be a challenge for the most experienced professionals as well as students, because also besides being busy and needing to get things done, often the student 
or the or or the uh, practitioner, the supervisor doesn't feel empowered to acknowledge or challenge practices and policies um, that may, they may observe as uh, discriminatory um, or um, deficit approaches. So it's it's both sometimes the time, the priorities, as well as um, the sense of empowerment. So um, I want to invite. Um, as we get into this, I want to just ask um, both Nancy and Mihai if you will join my com join the conversation now. Um, and um, uh, because I know Nancy, you and I were talking about um, just the the reality of implementing some of these sometimes is very difficult. Um, you. You, you work with how many students? <laughs> Several hundred. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and, and placing them um, and really addressing some of the realities of this. Thank you, Becky. Uh, it's great to talk about this. And uh, I oversee, we have a very large pro, uh, field education program at Rutgers uh, in New Jersey, and we have over a thousand students in field placements uh, during the year. I oversee about 500 students in the, in the region that I work in. And uh, the goal is to aspire to the service learning components of supervision, reflection, and service, and reciprocal uh, service and learning. And often the tension uh, within placements uh, does arise when there isn't that dialogue that uh, Becky was talking about where uh, a supervisor is anxious to have the intern accomplish tasks, learn the task, learn the system as, at the status quo and really not make waves. And uh, the student is uh, occupied in thinking about what am I learning? Uh, how is this helping me? How will this help me prepare me for uh, the job market uh, when I finish? So there's uh, all this tension and uh, most of my work when there, when problems do arise is to really help both parties come together. Uh, it's really about how we can come together with the supervisor and the agency priorities and client priorities with student learning. And usually it takes both the supervisor and the student to step up and to modify their behavior in some way. And I'm always talking to students about how you can align with supervisors, join with supervisors, uh, ask for input. You, you love the supervisor's comments and guidance. It's very helpful uh, because uh, these tensions do arise without those critical conversations. Uh, and so that's uh, really going into uh, what we do here in our normal course of, of field education. Uh, and then we move into the uh, Global Study Abroad programs. Uh, Becky is the lead on this, and she uh, and I work together to move the short-term two-week programs into a, a block placement, a longer-term, uh, more immersive service learning model 
uh, for the Romania program that she leads and the Israel program. And I can just say a little bit about the Israel program that we do strive towards this service learning, reciprocal uh, 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 relationship uh, with the, the agencies that we work with in Israel. These are agencies that we have uh, longer term relationships with. The students take on projects that are multi-year projects. So they step into a project that is already in action, already in motion uh, from previous groups. And then they advance the work during their time, during the uh, four weeks in country that they have uh, their internship. Uh, and to advance the work. And then the next group does pick up on these projects. So there's this uh, great uh, experience of advancing the work. And in Israel, the, uh, it's an action-oriented culture. There is an emphasis uh, with our Israeli partners that focus on social justice, and there are lots of uh, opportunities during our study abroad programs to have group discussions and group reflections on their experiences. And the group experience is really very powerful. The students learn so much from their interactions with each other. It's a very diverse group. We have undergraduates, we have graduate students uh, from very diverse backgrounds and just coming together in that group is, is part of their learning, a very powerful uh, part of their learning. And then they have opportunities to reflect on what's happening in their individual field placements in Israel. The students uh, attend their internship in Israel four days during the week uh, at one or two agencies. Uh, and then they, we, have, uh, we engage with the community. It's primarily an Ethiopian uh, community of immigrants that the students are working with. And they, we are also living in that same community. So the experience is, is immersive. The, the students are living in the apartments in the same Ethiopian uh, community that they're working in. And so they interact with community leaders. They have dinners. Uh, we, uh, they were invited to the home of uh, uh, one, uh, uh, an activist, uh, an Ethiopian activist. And so it's very much tied with the community and what is helpful to the community. Uh, yeah. So the, these relationships are nurturing. Yeah, and I um, and thank you for talking about Israel because this is something that we 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 started with the the um, Romania program, and uh, as we moved it to the 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 uh, four weeks, um, and so there's a a, a, a pre departure of equivalent of about a week. Um, but it's, it's also very much integrated into the curriculum. So our, our um, course objectives are reflect our Council on Social Work Education competencies. I'm not going to go over these, but just to say that these guide the learning contracts that they do, both, both students, um, students in both of these programs. Um, that do. Um, and so just um, uh, just to kind of um, reflect on what you were um, saying, Nancy, about um, the, you know, how they're, they're coming into projects that have already been started by others. 
So there's some continuity. And the same with the, the Romania program. We've been doing this program. Well, Israel's been a number of years as well as, as Romania. And so I think this really, this, this uh, Augustine um, and colleagues developed this justice-oriented service learning program model. And I think this really reflects the, the approach that we have in terms of the three principles um, that can hopefully counter potential negative outcomes. Um, there's a sustained layered engagement multi-year partnership. So students, even though students are coming for a month, they're coming, but there's continuity because I go every year, Mihai works with me in, in um, Romania, and then Nancy and we have a, a local uh, organization that we work with there. Um, and so there's, there's continuity over, over the years. Um, and the participants, our students, um, are authors of their own experience. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and a lot of it is nurturing those community-centered partnerships and programs. And um, Mihai, you and I had this conversation um, uh, about um, these are just some of the organizations that, that we work with. Um, in Romania, um, there's a foundation for elderly support and day center, Autism Transylvania, a family uh, after school program, and then a center for adults with disabilities. So it's across the life cycle. These programs, our students have been going for years. And so they expect us, unfortunately, as was said in the previous uh, presentation, we're going to have to re-nurture some of these um, uh, relationships after we've uh, not been able to go for a couple of years. But I think what's unique about the global programs, um, and, and the same is true in, in Israel, is we, um, the, just because of the nature of the global programs, we put quite a bit of time in placing the students in preparing the students um, that I would say probably more than even in our domestic programs um, that, um, that we really help the students because they're not, they, they don't know the language. So they're gonna need to work with the, with the program directors to determine what kinds of things they can do, what they need, so there's quite a bit of reciprocity in the planning. Do you want to say anything about that, Mihai? Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to add or emphasize that, you know, what makes this program running, you know, when previously presented, you know, the evolution, uh, we had more organization at the beginning. There were visits, you know, it, it took longer time to visit organization, to talk with them. But now we have like a nice pool of institution, a nice number of institution. And as you said, they're expecting us. And this one-on-one -on -one discussion that we have before, and even when the program starts with the social worker, with the director, really helps into getting to know each other, what, what they are expecting and what we are expecting. And you know, this happens very nicely in, in this program where there are fewer students, it doesn't happen in our regular, let's say, field education. As, as Nancy was saying, we have 200, nearly 300 students, you know, overall bachelor students. So when we try to place those students to, to the same institutions, um, we really don't have the time to discuss with them and to, you know, establish common goals and common learning objective for the institution and for uh, and for the students, for, for our students. So uh, our field practice regular, let's say field practice happens, as you said, is very reality based. So there are a lot of constraints, uh, but with this program, with this international program, we, we trying to compensate, let's say some of our um, 
misfortunes or i don't know how to how to spell that yeah. how to say that mm -hmm. yeah and i i think that you know it's been interesting working together on this presentation um because we you know i i have spent some time really evaluating this um you know uh, uh, a little more and i want to um i just want to take a little time just to um um reflect on some of the comments of students and um uh and then uh Betka asked me to have like a recommendation so i do want to um I have just a few things I want to uh, suggest that hopefully that that we also are going to try. Um, but one of the things that I think is unique about global service learning um, is that um, it, it this is a, a reference Colopy uh, and colleagues that talked about this is it's immersive. And so it provides kind of the fertile ground for disorienting dilemmas moments of surprise, confusion. And I see this happen. Uh, we see this in all, you know, all of our students. I mean, I, I have students that I supervise in field here um, in New Jersey, and there are always these, um, these experiences. But when you're away from home uh, for a period of time, you can't necessarily go back to your comforts, your comfort zones. Um, and so you're 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 kind of um, in this period of, of dissonance or disruption for maybe a period period of time. Um, and so there's that unique quality about it. And it's really as um, as um, Nancy and Mihai were saying, it's really about the reflection. Um, reflection is the reciprocal reflective practices. Uh, it's key to um, key to really understanding and addressing the 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 dissonance, the power differentials, the the attitudes, um, and the learning can be uh, reflections can be individual, group, written, oral, activity based, um, artistic. Um, and just some of the, the comments of, you know, some of the reflections that I've um, read from students, um, from their journals, from their uh, various uh, discussions as well, um, is one is really about the engagement in the relationship. And again, this goes back to what, um, what uh, Barbara was saying earlier, where we're, if you're working in different languages, you're communicating through other means than words, art, music, movement, drama, sports, games. Um, and this really heightens the student's appreciation for nonverbal communication. Uh, I think we use words too often anyhow. And so I think this is an important uh, outcome. Um, just others is really exploring some of the policies that address intolerance of institutional oppression, racism, gender discrimination. Uh, one thing that our students learn about, which they are not often aware of, is the Roma um, and discrimination against the Roma. Um, but they can look at the, the policies and then <clears throat> see that sometimes it's not about the policies, it's about the implementation. And so this is something that I think students are made um, aware of. Students sometimes have explored their own um, histories. Um, I had a student who, uh, whose family had never expressed an interest of going um, to Romania, finding the roots, and she was able to visit the home synagogue in the streets of her great-grandfather. Um, and then just really challenging the difference in norms in client interactions, touch. We have become so sensitive in our society around uh, not touching uh, because of fear of, of uh, I mean, it's, it's really a respect of, of um, not, you know, tolerating abusive behavior. Um, and so this, you know, as students watch, uh, as students see the difference maybe in approach to discipline or how structured or flexible a program is. 
um, sometimes these are things that that they reflect on and can be uh, can be aware of. Um, and then just the mutual problem sol problem solving with um, their agency, with their organization they're working with, um, and negotiating uh, if they're planning an activity. Um, you know, what goals do I have? What goals do you have? And really trying to, to, to negotiate that. Um, and then the other I wanted to reflect on is, is just the access to supervision. Um, the students, because we're living together, as, as Nancy was saying as well, they're living in the community. Um, they're living with their peers. So they're constantly talking about what they're doing. So there's a peer supervision and mentoring that's going on um, really constantly, I would say. Um, and supervision, I'm accessible there with, uh, with them. Uh, Mihai provides some of the supervision. Um, and so it's, it's, it's interactive um, and it's accessible. Um, one student said, I found the daily reflection and supervision valuable to my learning and growth process. I had not done much face-to-face -face service prior to this trip, and now I feel much more comfortable managing uh, my, my ambivalence. Um, so just, um, I think, some of the confidence and skill building that's also um, reflected on. So we have, um, let's see, just about um, 10, 12 minutes, and I want to have a, a discussion. And um, Nancy and Mihai would ask any to reflect on any of these as well. So some of the recommendations, one of the recommendations I would just say is um, the field is the classroom. Um, and this is something that Nancy referred to earlier. I mean, they're uh, shopping together. They're uh, going to different events together. So every experience counts, whether it's researching, planning, writing, shopping, drinking coffee, getting lost. These all contribute to the learning. Um, and I think also just exploring the art of asking questions. Um, and and so sometimes turning these statements, and I'll give you an example. Mihai, we heard this the, we heard this the other day in talking with a, <clears throat> one of our former students talking about experience and then saying something like, "Oh, that was cheap." And I hear this. I hear students say this. and and I have a visceral reaction to that. Um, and And so, you know, what do you mean cheap? Cheap for whom? Because again, that kind of comment reflects they're still home. They haven't yet, they haven't really yet connected to the context. And so really listening to these kinds, really listening to these kinds of things. And so reflect, reflect, reflect. Um, this, these are, I think it's the reflection and really integrating um, some, some of the, 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 Diverse practices, and this is some of the things that we're going to, um, Nancy and I have talked about, and Mihai have talked about integrating um, into our programs that are coming up. And this is a cultural genogram, um, and it's a model that I actually have integrated into our clinical practice course. And I thought this would be good for our students prior to departure really as a group, building the group, and it's the power of the group that, that has been talked about, the solidarity, um, and getting the group, giving the group an opportunity to reflect on their own similarities and differences, how they look, what roles they play, um, including gender, sexual orientation, social class, age, um, some of their own values in their own family, their pride, their shame. Um, because based on family theory, we take our families with us um, and reflect that. And so really using this as a way to, to bridge some of those differences um, and, and build on some of the, the uh, 
the, the, the resilience that students uh, take. Um, this is another model that uh, you many of you may have heard because I know uh, Dr. Clayton has presented, I think at um, one of the internet, the European uh, service learning conferences. Um, and it's a, a great model. I have the references for anybody that's interested. Describe, examine, articulate, and this is similar to some of the reflections that we um, that we use. And then this was one I just want to end with and give us time to have any um, discussion is tips to study abroad, simple letters for complex engagement. And this is a little booklet written by Tara Nuff, who um, she does study abroad programs in India, but it's, um, you write letters and she encourages you to write handwritten letters. Um, I don't know how our students would feel about that, but um, I can try. Uh, but you write to a thing, dear journal, trees, flower, garment industry, coffee, um, different things, to an idea, dear hope, dear sensitivity, dear activism, dear play, dear thought, uh, dear work, um, people, um, and to yourself. Whatever role you see yourself in, you might want to write a letter to yourself. And they're very clever. Um, and I, I just think this is a terrific idea to diversify the reflection and, um, and, and strengthen it. Um, so I just want to, um, and again, um, we can share the, the, um, the slides. And I want to just stop there and see um, if Nancy or Mihai, you have anything to add to that? Um, I think these are some interesting things that I would like to try. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add that in terms of recommendations. I really think that we need to be more creative. And we have discussed that as, as long as we have a curriculum or syllabus, and it has to be in a certain way in order to make sure that everything is checked there in terms of competencies, learning content and everything. Uh, it will be very difficult you know, to engage in, in an effective service learning. So we'll need to, to let go of our own power as, profession, <laughs> as professors, <laughs> as, yeah, as you know, people who know everything. And we like to think of ourselves as we know what a student needs once he exits, you know, the, the school. So being more creative, but this creativity needs to be sustained, you know, from a higher level as well. Because if the ministry or the university don't let go of, don't, don't give autonomy, real autonomy to, you know, to programs, to schools, to professors, then it's very difficult to implement, you know, service learning, you know, as it should be. So that was my <laughs> input and my reflection, you know, letting go of my own power and try to listen more, as you said, to the others. I can just add to that. Uh, that's a great comment, Mihai, that during the study abroad programs, the supervision, as Becky described, takes place in the, at the cafe, at the, at the community center, when you're walking from place to place. And so it really does facilitate this sharing of power because again, we're also living in the apartments or in the dorm where students are. And although there we have separate rooms and of course we maintain proper boundaries, there is a letting go of some of this uh, authoritative posture. There's a sharing of power in, in the relationship, in the supervision, and uh, it's really quite powerful. 